Well, thank you so much. It's a blessing to be back with you guys. And man, what a great time of worship. So thankful for what the Lord is doing here. And, and just, again, just want to extend my gratitude, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Rob, for the opportunity to come and share with you guys from the Word of God. And uh, it's a real privilege. And I'm so thankful to be here tonight. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, the message entitled, Run Your Race. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, if you would follow along with me, men, as we read through this together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Will you pray with me tonight, guys? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together with brothers here, and Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move mightily. Lord, we don't want just another sermon, another Bible study. Lord, we want a piece of heaven tonight. Lord, we pray that heaven would touch earth here, or that your Spirit, Lord, would just move in and through our lives, and lives would be changed. Decisions would be made tonight, Lord, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, within the scriptures, the Christian life is illustrated in a number of different ways. For example, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in his first epistle in the ninth chapter, said that the Christian life was actually like a boxing match. He said, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. And then Paul also wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 6. And this time he said that the Christian life was like a wrestling match. He said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The Christian life, like a boxing match, a fight, like a wrestling match. And then in writing to Timothy in his second epistle, he depicted the Christian life like a war. You remember he said to Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, because no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he might please the one who enlisted him. And then again in 1 Corinthians, this time Paul likened the Christian life to construction when he said, according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another one builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. And then you come here to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and the writer of Hebrews likens the Christian life to a race. And the race begins when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. When you are born again, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you enter in to this race. And this race isn't a 50-yard, 100-yard dash. This is more like a marathon. You see, some of the believers, if you've read through the book of Hebrews, you know that many of these believers started out well in their spiritual race. But now, some of them have actually gotten tripped up by religious practices and rituals. Some of them became spectators in the race, no longer running. Some of them had even fallen and weren't running at all any longer. Therefore, the writer here is calling upon these believers to run their race with endurance. And if the Hebrew believers were going to finish strong and they were going to finish well, there were some important things that they had to consider. And we also want to consider these same things because we don't don't, don't want to start well. We want to finish strong. We want to finish well. Maybe you had a terrible start. That doesn't mean you have to have a terrible finish. And so here we come, and the first thing I want you to realize, guys, tonight is that we're in a race. (laughs) I just said that, but maybe you didn't know that. Maybe that's a surprise to you. You didn't know that this was a race. You didn't know it was a fight. You didn't know that it was a wrestling match. You didn't know it was a war, but it is. 
In writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul asked them the question. He said, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Therefore, run in such a way that you may obtain it. It's like the Corinthians didn't know that they were actually in a race. And so he says, don't you know that you're supposed to be running in this race? Don't you know that there's a finish line? Don't you know that there's a reward at the end of the race? That you're going to be rewarded for the race that you have run? Now, it's important to understand tonight. In this race, I'm not racing against you. I'm not competing against you. You're not competing against me. I'm running my own race. I'm actually competing against myself. And I want to run as hard as I can. I'm not looking to this guy, not looking at that person. I just want to run the race that God has set for me. And I want to finish this race strong. And each one of us has our race to run, our own course that has been set out for us. But listen, guys, we don't want to simply run to run. We want to run in order to win. We want to run to win. I was thinking if I could go back in my mind, like when was the first race I ever had? You ever, maybe not. But I was thinking in light of this text, what was the, what was the first race that I ever had? I, the farthest I could go back was kindergarten. That was a quite a while ago. But in kindergarten, I remember it was a Thursday night Bible study. Pastor Chuck was teaching. My parents were at church. And all the kindergartners, they took out to the big field. And as a kindergartner, the field was huge. It probably isn't that big. I mean, it's there. I could see it today. But it, but it felt huge. And that thing they just took us out there to wear us out, you know, kindergartners, and then bring us back in just tired. Uh, but anyhow, it worked. And they got us all on this side. And they said, all right, ready. And I, this, it's vivid in my mind. Okay, we're gonna, we want you to run all the way down. you got to touch the fence. I'm very specific. I remember that. Touch the fence. And then run all the way back. Now, if you don't touch the fence, you're going to basically be disqualified. So anyhow, they get, oh, your mark. Get set. And then they, they said, go. And I tell you what, I do remember I wanted to win that race. I want to crush all the other kindergartners. I just, I mean, just if nothing else, just to be able to say, I'm the fastest kindergartner here tonight at this Bible study. And I'm pretty sure I won. No, I don't even know. I can't remember that. No, I think I did. Well, it's possible. But anyhow, I ran that race. Then there was another race. I started going through my mind. I guess I had a series of races and I wasn't even into track and field. But later on, same place. This time I was in junior high. I was going to the, same, I was going to the schools on the same property and we had to run the 100 yard dash and they would pair us up with another person and I got paired up with the fastest kid in the school his name was Casey like a train this kid was so fast he was super short but extremely fast I mean he was fast all through kindergarten we went to school all the way up he's winning every single race and I got paired up with him in junior high and so, you know, they said, ready, set, go. I ran faster than I have ever. This guy, this guy made me elevate my game. I mean, I really like dug in and I was running so fast. I know I didn't win that one, but I was very close. I got the, one of the fastest times I'd ever had. Uh, not as fast as his, but nonetheless, I was running with the intent. I don't want to just lose to this kid. I actually would love to beat him. Anyhow. The point I'm making, gentlemen, is that when you get in the race, you want to run to win. But as you begin to run, and you start to realize this is a battle, this is a fight, this is a struggle, you start to think to yourself, am I going to be able to actually complete this race successfully? Am I going to make it through? Moreover, when you see other people who were running also falling to the left and falling to the right, and you're thinking, if that guy tripped up in the race, I mean, am I going to make it? And so, in order to encourage the believers here, these Hebrew believers, and I think also to encourage us, he gives a series of examples that will serve as an encouragement and also inspire us in our race. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, if I could draw your attention to that passage again, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, when the writer says, therefore, it takes you back to everything that he had written in the previous chapter. And in the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 40, we call it the hall of faith. Now, you may not make it into the hall of fame, but I'd much rather be in the hall of faith right here with all these names like Moses and Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and David and Samson and Jephthah and Gideon and Rahab's in there also. All of these people in the hall of faith, they're the great cloud of witnesses. They ran their race, and as we observe their race as recorded in Scripture, it's not something that you simply want to look at and admire. The Lord wants us to emulate it. The Lord wants us to follow their example and finish our race by faith the same way they finish their race by faith. 
Now also make note of this. When it says that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, maybe you thought that they're up in heaven, Abraham and Moses and all the patriarchs are up there and they're sitting there and they are watching our race. Like as if they're saying, come on, you could do it. Moses has got a staff, you better. No, it's not like that. They're not up in heaven watching us run. If heaven is watching us run down here, I don't think it would be as awesome as the Bible says heaven's going to be. I think they're caught up in the presence of the Lord just worshiping him like we're going to do when we get there. But when it says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, the intent of the writer is that in view of the faith that is observed in the lives of these men and women, it's actually a witness to us. And the reader then is exhorted to finish the race exercising the same kind of faith that was portrayed in all of these heroes that are recorded in the 11th chapter. They finish successfully. They receive their reward. We also are going to finish and we're going to receive a reward from the Lord. As believers, we're in a race. We also have encouragement to run in light of the examples of those that have run before us. But also I want you to see, guys, in verse 1, that there are certain things that could be a hindrance to our race. It says in verse 1, let us lay aside every weight. Now in ancient times, even at the present time, when runners would train to run in a race, they would attach weights to themselves. They get used to carrying uh, heavier weights. But when it came time to actually run in the race, every single training weight would be laid aside. Recently, I watched a documentary, maybe you saw it, of the fastest man on the planet. He's from Jamaica. His last name's Bolt. I mean, that's just like, it just seems so right. But anyhow... They, they go back and they, they show where he trains there in Kingston and where he grew up in this remote area of Jamaica and he really wanted to play this sport but his dad said, no, I think you should be a runner and he started running and found out he had a gift and then they moved to like his actual training regiment which I find is, it was fascinating. And one of the things I saw when he was in, the, I mean, it's the heat of Jamaica, he's got a belt tied around him and a, and a big rope behind him with a sled and on top of that sled are like 45 pound weights and he is running across the field faster than you and I could run without the weights. I mean, this guy's just booking it, and he's just running, and he's, he's training. But I'll tell you this, when he comes inside of the arena, every weight is gone. There's no weights attached to him. There's one goal in mind, that's to finish, and that's to set world records, and he does. It's rather amazing. But he has to lay these things aside, weights. Now, the word weight here is actually a word meaning an encumbrance. It refers to bulk or mass. It's used to describe anything that would hinder or prevent someone from doing something. So the question then becomes, well, what is a weight for the Christian? What's a weight for the Christian man tonight? I believe that every single man in this room, all of us, need to go before the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to reveal what is a weight that would need to be set aside. And understand this, a weight doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It could be a good thing that keeps us from the best thing. Something that just kind of slows you down, just kind of hinders your stride, impedes your progress. Something like that that just, I don't, I don't necessarily need this. I can just, I can set this aside and I find myself being able to run a straighter course without this. Again, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, in chapter 6, he said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Again, writing the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this time he said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify or build me up. Paul said, there's certain things. I have the liberty to do all kinds of things. But certain things that I have the liberty to do, they would actually slow me down in my race. And so I choose not to do them. It wasn't like Paul said, is this a sin? Can I do it? Is it not a sin? Can I not do it? Paul just looked at it and said, if this is going to slow me down, I'm just going to set it aside. I want to run. He laid aside the weight. You remember that Jesus talked about, I believe, what can be weights in the life of an individual in Mark chapter 4 when he said, the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, come in and they choke out the word so that it never comes to maturity. Things that choke out the word, things that hinder the race, hold us back. 
Jesus said in Luke 21, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. Is there anything weighing your heart down tonight? Something that needs to be set aside. Each one of us, Christians in this race, need to go before the Lord, ask Him to reveal what the weights are that are hindering us, and ask the question, what do I need to lay aside? Lord, what is slowing me down tonight? And I guarantee you, you ask the Lord that question, the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and tell you. He may be speaking to your heart right now. I'm praying that He is. Just showing you, this needs to be set aside, man. I think of the disciples when they were called by Jesus to follow Him. Came to Peter, James, John. He said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What did they do? Left their nets, left their boats, and they just followed after Jesus. They couldn't bring that stuff along. Jesus came to Matthew, called him, said, follow me. Matthew left the tax office and followed Jesus. There were just certain things that they laid aside. Are there any encumbrances or any weights in your life presently that are slowing you down, holding you back? Lay them aside and run. Listen, I know some guys that one of the things that they're, I'll let the Holy Spirit tell you, but I just, I've just observed some things. Some guys are just, they're weighed down by the political scene right now. I mean, it's just all they talk about. Like, hey, bro, uh, yeah, let's talk about Jesus. I, you know, I don't, and they just constantly, it's just, and they just, they, they, they go home and they watch the news. And what's the, what's the, how, what's the percentage points on how many, does he have the, the delegates? You know, it's just, or they, then, they, then they get in their car and they listen to it. And then they go home and they listen to it. And then that's all they ever talk about. And it just can be a weight, man. It's not a bad thing, but it could be keeping them from the best thing. And so you just lay it aside. Some people, they're so into their social media scene that like, man, they got to take a picture of their breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, coffee, dinner. One, one. Listen, we don't want to know everything that you're doing. Going into the bathroom, you know, who cares? You're weighing me down, man. So, maybe those are some of the things that you might want to lay aside. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. But not only are the weights that are to be laid aside, but pay close attention here, brothers, because he also says lay aside the sin that can so easily ensnare us. It's one thing to lay aside the weights, but it's essential that we lay aside sin. Sin will always hinder the race. I'll tell you this, it'll even cripple the runner. And take you out of the race, if possible, so that you could never run again. Trying to run the Christian race while living in sin is like strapping 200 extra pounds to your body in the middle of the desert without water trying to run your race. You, you, you're going to die. Sin produces death. You won't make it very far. Now, it says here, this sin can easily ensnare us. And the word means cleverly. And the verbal form, this is very interesting, it means to place itself around, to encircle. You can have a real difficult time running a straight race, won't you, if you're encircled? Or where are you going to go? What direction are you going to go if you're completely ensnared? And it says here, it very, it, it's easy. It's a sin that can easily beset us and surround us and stop us in the race. It's the equivalent of saying it's a sin in good standing. you have any sins that are in good standing tonight? You say, what, what does that mean? It's those sins that you can easily justify. It's those sins that you find excuses for or blame your wife for or somebody else for. It's so easy. It gets a grip on us so quickly. In a moment of weakness or flesh, we find ourselves being ripped off again, tripped up by this thing. Maybe because we've allowed it to cling to us. We've made provision for it. We haven't set it aside. We haven't put it to death. We just got it over here just in case. I'm, I'm not, hey, listen, I'm not doing that right now, but if I ever need to, it's there. I mean, do you want to be easily ensnared? Then that's, that's how you do it. So we don't want to be easily ensnared. We want to be able to run the race. Here's a test. A sin that easily besets us is a sin that we tend to cling to. It's a sin that we get angry when it's rebuked. It's a sin that we will quickly defend. If we see, hey, listen, man, don't be so hard on the guy, you know. That's not, that's not a bad thing, you know, <laughs> because maybe you're involved in it. Or it's a sin that we're unwilling to part with. All these things have the potential to trip us up. Guys, not only to trip us up, this is really sobering because it also has the potential to actually disqualify us in the race. Now, Paul the Apostle said, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, disqualified doesn't mean I lost my salvation, but it does mean I'll probably lose opportunity. 
I'll lose the opportunity that I would have had because I didn't compete according to the race. How many, I mean, you see this happen from time to time. The Olympics are coming up, they're around the corner and you see this runner break all these records and wow, they got so many medals and then they do the drug test. Man, he was on the juice. I mean, that's how he did what he did. That's how he was able to get it done and lift that much and do this thing and disqualified. And because I remember, remember that one time years ago when that tiny little, I don't know if she was Romanian gymnast, she like took some cold medicine, disqualified. I mean, seriously, poor kid. But anyhow, you understand, disqualified, missed opportunity. Stay away from the cold medicine, brothers. I mean, just disqualifies you from the race. That's what happened. You lost opportunity. And how many of us tonight, how many of us know men who were one time, man, they were running hard. They were running strong. They were an inspiration to us. We watched their life and thought, man, I, I want to run like that guy. And then they got tripped up. And now what are they doing? Disqualified. Disqualified. They're not doing what they were doing before. The devil got in there and Hey, man, they still, you know, they, a lot of them, they get restored. They come back to the Lord, but they, they never have that same opportunity they had before. It's like they got disqualified from the race, and it's very sobering in, in a good way. What are those sins that can easily beset us? Here's a few. This probably doesn't apply to anybody here, but listen, here's a few. An unsanctified temper. That's righteous indignation. That's not, that's not a temper. That's, that's my Spanish blood. It's just kind of, it's a Latin. No, no. No, it's not nothing to do with being Latin. You can be a straight whitey and have a bad attitude. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? That's not the problem. The problem is the flesh. We're all born with it. It has to be crucified. Isn't it interesting? In the Old Testament, there's one thing the Lord loves, burning flesh. He loves the smell of flesh burning, dying. That's what he wants from us. How about an impure and defiled imagination? You're just feeding it. Just feeding it. Man, guys, you know this. You know this. Pornography is an epidemic for men. And not just outside the church, but in the church. Guys are just, you talk about besetting. You talk about the potential to be disqualified and lose everything. That, that's something that'll take you down and rob you. And if you're there tonight, God can free you. We sang it tonight. Chains can be broken. Shackles can be taken off if you'll turn to the Lord and repent. He can do it. He can do it. You don't have to be condemned. How about a proud heart? Oh, man. Preach on that. I, we all get prideful. A vain mind. A taste for worldly company. You know, I just don't like being around Christians. I mean, I know I am one, but I just, I feel far more comfortable with, you know, with, the, with guys from work, at the bar, hanging out together, having tacos. You know, you just, <laughs> something needs to change there, man. Something needs to change. How about a tendency to exaggerate in your speech? A proneness for envy or jealousy or backbiting, criticism, a fondness of pleasure. Setting these things aside is so important and it requires the power of the Holy Spirit and the discipline that he gives to us. They can easily ensnare us. We lay them aside, put them down, break them off, turn and run. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, the Sermon on the Mount, he said when it comes to sin, we wanna deal drastically with it. He said if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, just cut it off. Like, if, literally? No, obviously, none of us would have eyes or hands tonight. He's talking about, he's using it in a sense of deal with it drastically. Don't mess around with it. Don't prop it up. Don't, don't, don't entertain it. Don't play with it. Don't put it there. Get rid of it. Just done with it tonight. Don't leave it in your, in your cupboard. Dump it out. Dude, I spent so much money. Yeah, great. Dump it. You don't want to buy the subscription. Throw it away. I remember years ago, there was a guy that got radically saved in our church. And he, uh, and uh, not in San Juan Capistrano, by the way, a different church that I was pastoring. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> this recorded, uh, well, he, his name will remain anonymous. But anyhow, I remember he got saved, radically saved. And uh, he had this huge collection of magazines that aren't good magazines to have. Let's just put it that way. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, he said, well, have all, and he collected like, I mean, his, like a long time. And they were worth, apparently, a lot of money. He said, well, I was thinking about, like, maybe I could sell them and give the money to the church. I go, no, no, you can't. No, no. You take them out and put them in the trash tonight. Oh, we don't want that. And sure enough, that night, whoo, just threw it away, gone. Just gone. Done with it. Drastically dealt with it. Radically changed his life forever. That can happen, man. 
God can do it. And so, I think there's one other entanglement that I find, at least in the ministry, that I come across. And it's the past. The past. I know a lot of people that are entangled by their past. Who they used to be before Christ. BC. This is what I used to look like. This is what I used to do. This is how I used to roll. This is what I used. Listen, the past is the past. Paul the Apostle had a past held the coats of those who stoned the first martyr of the church. He was a blasphemer, an insolent man. He even confesses that. He alludes to it in in Philippians. And here's what he says concerning the past and how he moved on from it. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I can't change the past, But you know something? Through the power of the Spirit, I can do something about the present and certainly something about the future. Guys, you can move on from that. And if you just, you got a weight on you tonight, it's the past, and it's just like, I can't get out from under this. And the devil, he's a historian, man. He loves to bring up all these things all the time at the most inopportune times. Here we are worshiping. There's a thought. Oh, man, it's terrible. Maybe you're driving down a particular street that you used to drive down before you were a Christian, and it's like nostalgia just sets in, and whom your mind just starts... Oh, man, I remember what I used to drive down the street. Oh, I remember what I used to do. And you start thinking about those things in the past, and you get condemned. Listen, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You can move on from that tonight, guys. You can be free. Lay it aside. Run your race. So we're in a race. We're encouraged by the examples of others to run our race. We lay aside every weight and the sin that easily ensnares us. And then also notice this, guys, in verse 1. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Another word for endurance here is the word patience. I'm sure it's one of all of our favorite words, patience. It means to remain under something. It means to be steadfast. And it's the picture of an individual that is unflinchingly bearing up under a heavy load and describes the quality of character which doesn't allow one to surrender to circumstances or to succumb under that trial. Endurance built into us. How is endurance built into the life of the Christian? Listen, I don't think there's a, well, maybe there is, but probably for most of us tonight, none of us are thinking, you know what? You know what I'm going to do tonight? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my wife come pick up the, I'm going to run home tonight. I live 26.2 miles from here. I'm going to run home. I'm going to run a marathon tonight. If you haven't trained for a marathon, you will die. I mean, you just will not make it. You'll be on the side of the road one mile down. Uh, uh, 911. You, you won't make it. You understand? You, you have, there has to be endurance that's built up into you. you that just doesn't happen overnight. You've got to do the hard yards. You get, it's the days when you don't want to run, the days you don't want to do this. Those are the days that you really got to put in the time so you can have, have the endurance. It's built up over, over time and even through difficult times. Listen, the one way that God builds patience into us, James tells us, it's through trials. Did you know that trials produces within us endurance? And sometimes we think, Lord, I can't run anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Listen, if I don't do this in your life right now, listen, I'm building endurance into your life right now, spiritually. Because you got a, you got a few more laps to run. And let me just tell you, the next lap is going to be a little bit harder than the other two. So I'm going to build endurance into you so that you're able to run and you're going to be able to complete it. I'm going to do it. But we got to run with endurance, guys. And that doesn't come naturally. That's something the Spirit of God has to work within us. And remember, these believers who are getting this letter, they want to quit. They want to stop running. They just want to, they want to be done with it. Maybe that's how you came in here tonight. Your wife said, are you going to the Bible study tonight? Oh, man, they're having food, right? Okay, I'll go. So you came. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Whatever it takes, you know. And so you came, but, but in reality, you're sitting here tonight, and you're thinking, you know, I, I would like to stop. I'm, it's, it's a hard race. It's, I'm tired, man. I'm tired of getting beat down at work. I'm tired of hearing this. I'm tired of this. And, and all these things you want to stop, stop running. Listen, endurance. Endurance is being built into us, guys. God wants us to keep running, to run with endurance. And as we run our race, we'd only run with endurance, and we lay these things aside. Look at verse 2. We're almost through. It says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we run our race, 
It's important that we run a focused race. You can't run in the race looking to the right, looking to the left. If, if a runner came into the stadium and began to run and he looked at this runner or that runner or be got you know, overwhelmed by the crowd, he'd get passed up, he'd get lapped, he wouldn't be able to run a straight race. You remember Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. In this race that we're in, it's imperative that we remain focused. And who do I focus on? I look at Jesus. I look at Jesus. That's who my my attention is drawn to. I fix my eyes upon the Lord. And let's face it, guys. There are, for us as men, there are things constantly trying to divert our attention off of this, off of that, off of the Lord. I mean, from from the moment you wake up, from the moment you wake up, it's like the bell rings, ding, ding, fight is on, ding, ding, put your shoes on, you're, you're, we're, we're running today. I mean, it's just constant. And so I have to have this, this focus, my attention placed upon Jesus and not take my eyes off him. The moment I take my eyes off of him, I find myself sinking. I think of Peter at the end of John's gospel in John chapter 21, when Jesus revealed to Peter the way in which he, his race would end. Remember what he told him? He told him, Peter, there's coming a time when they're going to take you and they're going to lead you where you don't want to go and they're going to stretch out your hands. He was talking about the fact that Peter would one day die a death by crucifixion. Church history tells us Peter was crucified and he desired to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to die like his Lord. But when he first heard Jesus say, this is what's going to happen to you, immediately he looked at John, the other apostle, and said, what about this guy? How's this guy going to finish? I mean, what's his race like? And I love, man, the classic words of Jesus that have resonated in my ears over and over again. Here it is. Jesus said to him, what is that to you? You follow me. Guys, that's it right there. What is that to me? I've got I've to run a straight race. I've got to be looking at Jesus. And as I look at Jesus, I remember a number of things. I remember that he ran his race well. He endured. And Jesus, listen, you could read Hebrews chapter 11 and read all those names from Moses and all the rest of them that are listed in the hall of faith, and none of them ran as great of a race as Jesus did. He ran the greatest race ever. And I want you to know this, guys. He ran it for us. He ran the race for you. He ran the race for me. And he finished well. He endured. He even endured the cross, though he despised the shame. It wasn't an easy race for Jesus. Well, he's Jesus. He could could race. It's not a big deal for him. Oh, no. In his humanity, he felt everything that that we would feel and more so. We'll never be able to understand this side of heaven, all that Jesus endured, all that the cross entailed until we get to glory. That's why I really believe that when we get there, we just fall down and worship him because we now understand what we only understood in part while we were here. Because of the race that he ran, he ran it for us and he finished it strong. He's the example. I have to keep looking to him. And what was it says here that there was a joy that was actually set before him that enabled him to endure. Now think about this. What was the joy that was set before Jesus that would enable him to endure? I think there's a couple things. One, I think it was being reunited with his father in glory. Getting back to that place where he was before the world began. In John chapter 17, Jesus actually prayed and he said, Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world was. The the thought of being back in that glory with the Father was a blessing to Jesus. There was joy in that. But guys, I think the principal joy of Jesus was saving you and me. You were the joy. I was the joy. The joy of knowing that we would not be separated from God for all of eternity in a place called hell, but that we could be saved and set apart and have our sins forgiven and be reunited with the Lord in perfect, intimate fellowship throughout all of eternity. That, brothers, was the joy that was set before him and he was able to endure. That's why he ran his race so well. He ran it for us. As I think about that, I think if he ran his race for me, Lord, I wanna run my race for you. I wanna run my race for you. We're in a race We have encouragement and inspiration through the examples of others who have run their race. We need to lay aside the things that could hinder the race. We want to run the race with endurance. We want to run the race with focus, looking unto Jesus. And then finally, the writer takes it one more step further. And in verse 3, he said, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. 
you have not resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. The word consider means to think, to reckon, to count up, to reason with thoroughness and completeness. It's used in what is called a particular tense that means to do it now, not to delay. But it's, there's an urgency that's attached to it. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus and know this. We, we haven't, nobody crucified me on a cross like they did him. No one, no one has done what they, in my life, done to me what they did to Jesus. He has suffered greater things than I will ever suffer. And therefore, he knows how to help me in this race that I'm running. So I want to consider him and I want to look at him and keep my eyes fixed upon him. And it says here, lest you become weary and discouraged. You know what that tells me? It tells me that there are going to be days in this race that we're going to be weary and we're going to be discouraged. You know that's normal? I think it was John Stott that said that the Christian's chief occupational hazards are depression and discouragement. Listen, if you came to Christ and you thought it was going to be rainbows and sparkles for the rest of your life, and ne- I mean, that's kind of weird, isn't it? But anyways, you thought it was just going to be rosy, no problems ever again. I have a daughter. I mean, it's just one of those things, you know, and three sons. But anyhow, the point being, it's just not the way it is. I mean, look at the life of the Apostle Paul. Look at the lives of those in the hall of faith. You think it was easy for them? No, it wasn't. Look at the life of Jesus. It wasn't easy. There are going to be days when you're going to be weary. There's going to be days when you feel discouraged. There's going to be days when you want to quit. And you say, well, what do I do then? Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. You know, I know people right now, man, who they, they're, just, they're just in this, this funk, in this depression. And, and they come and they say, this and that, and these are my life, and this is me, and how is it, and I can't, and me, me, and I, and all me, and, and some of me, and I feel like. <laughs> and it's just, basically, by the end of the conversation, do you know how many times you said I? How many times you said me, myself? Basically, part of the depression sometimes can be all the focus and attention upon ourselves. When I need to get my eyes, and it's a natural thing to do. It's natural. We need something supernatural. We need something spiritual. I need to look at Jesus if you're discouraged tonight, guys. And it's very possible. (laughs) Then the best thing that we can do is consider Jesus. Look at Jesus. And maybe the word for a man here tonight is you just need to get your eyes back on Jesus. This, This is the issue right here at hand. It's just getting your eyes back on him. Maybe you've kind of diverted your attention. You've been distracted. And and I I gotta just refocus upon the Lord. You remember the psalmist in Psalm 42? He talks to himself. He says, remember, you, didn't you guys talk to yourself? You know you do, you know, and you just don't want people to see you when you do, but there are times, at least some of us right in the front row, we, we talk to ourselves, we say stuff, you know, like you're talking to yourself and nobody, your wife's like, who are you talking to? Myself, you know, I'm just kind of reason, working through it right now, just working it out, you know? Boss does think I think what are you talking about? Just myself. Anyhow, the psalmist does that. The psalmist in Psalm 42 talks to himself and he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? It's like he's saying to himself, What's your problem? To himself. And then he answers the question and he says, Hope in God. He gives himself the solution. You ever read through the Psalms, guys? You have you ever read some of the things that David wrote? If David sat in front of a therapist, and let me just read read to you what I've been writing be like this guy is clinical we need to put him somewhere i mean the things that david wrote like he went to the very bottom i mean just to the depths but every time he would come out of the depths when when he would begin to look at the lord it's like the psalm just takes you down to the pit and you're down here in this then suddenly he says hope in god it just brings him right up what what changed it for david what changes it for us The, the focus the attention what he considered he took it off the circumstance put it back onto god and suddenly things changed changed Hey, somebody said if if the outward look isn't working for you, try the upward look. (laughs) Look up. Look at the Lord. Finally, two verses I want to conclude with. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I know you guys, in this men's study, you guys have been getting your marching orders, soldiers in the fight. Well, Paul's at the end of his battle. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I want you to see this because, guys, there is a reward at the end of our race. A reward. Look at what it says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Paul wrote and he said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul realized this race will one day come to an end. And when you really think about the race that we're running, guys, compared to eternity, it's not that long of a race. Eternity is forever. This race is, I mean, it's fast. It's, and compared to eternity, it's, it's a quick dash, really. But Paul says, I've finished the race, and there, there's a crown waiting for me. And I'm going to receive it, a reward. Last passage, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, just a few verses back to the right. He talks about this again. I think Paul must have been just a fan of athletics. He just, he just always was talking about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in verse 24, look what Paul says. Again, we alluded to this earlier. He said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, that means self-controlled, in all things. Why? They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. In those days, a runner would train for years just to compete in the Olympics. And when he won the race, he put in all that time, all that training to get, it says here, a perishable crown. And he would stand before the Bema seat and he would receive a crown. And the crown was basically, it was like a Christmas wreath for your head. I mean, how awesome is that? All that training. And you got, but it said something to everybody. You, you got the crown. You'd wear it around. Check this out. What's that? It's a tree on my head. I mean, this is a crown that I received. I competed. And this thing, this, this thing was perishable. You'd have to keep watering it because it would wilt and, you know, you couldn't even frame it. I mean, eventually it would just come to nothing. It's like a pine needle. It's just disintegrating. But they did all of that for a perishable crown. Paul says, I'm running. I'm not running for something perishable, something imperishable. You know, I was thinking this week, uh, you know, I, I had, uh, like some of you, maybe you competed in athletics and you went through the training, you went through the practices, you did all these things so that you could get the medal to put on your jacket, to get a trophy so you could put it on the mantle. Recently, my wife had me clean the garage. And maybe that's a word for someone here. But anyhow, I went to, uh, uh, lay it aside. I went in and, you know, when you have four kids, you just collect stuff over the years. And you don't even know where this came from. And that box doesn't even, we didn't open this from the last time we moved. I don't even want to look in it. Let's just throw it out because it could be something that I don't want. So I, um, I'm cleaning out the garage and I come to one particular box and it had, it was smaller than that. It was, it was so big. I was like this, but it was actually, I don't want to exaggerate here. I'm going to lay that aside. It was a little box, but it had my trophies in it. Trophies, medals, trophies. My mom had kept them. She gave them to me. They were in my garage. And, I had, and, and my wife said, why don't you throw those away? They're like plastic and fake, fake gold. They're not even real. You know what? She throws away. I was like, I was thinking we could like decorate the house with these. I mean, I don't know if we could, uh, you know, she wasn't having it. So as I'm going through it, I'm working through it in my mind. You know that one song, all of my trophies at last I lay down. I'm like, you know what? Okay, I'll just lay them down now. I'm going to throw them in the trash. And I struggled. Actually, I went out and I, I put them in the trash, and I, I, but I did keep one. There was one that I had. It was like a plaque. And the funny thing about this is a true story. The funny thing about this one is it had a little wrestler on it. That was what I was doing. I was wrestling. And, and his, he would kept falling down. Like the, the, it, it had broken. So it would like, the guy would be upside down. And I'd prop it back up. But it, ha, it had my name, and it had a particular record that I held. And I thought I wanted my sons to see that uh, for years to come, uh, to show their sons that. Um, <laughs> You know, I just, I just kept it in the garage. It was the one I had in there. And finally, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw that one away. And I, I, what am I going to take this to heaven? Lord, check this out. Is this awesome? You know, it was perishable. I threw it away. No big deal. Because I'm not, I'm not fighting. I'm not wrestling. I'm not running. I'm not building for something that's temporary anymore. Something that's eternal. And you know why I think it's such a blessing, guys, to be able to receive a crown from the Lord? Because when you get there, the Bible says around the throne, everybody takes any crown they have and they just throw it at the feet of Jesus. 
And don't you, he ran his race for us. He laid aside his crown of glory and came and died in our place. Took a crown of thorns upon his head. And here we run this race for him and he gives us a crown and we just take it and we just throw it right back down at his feet with everybody else and just worship him for eternity. Guys, tonight, maybe you're here and you're running good. You're running strong. God's doing a work. Man, you've been, you've been running good. The Lord's just working and you just keep going. Be encouraged. May this be like just wind in your sails tonight, just filling your lungs, spiritual air. Just keep on going. Maybe for other guys, though, you're running, but you're not running like you used to run. You picked up some weights along the way. You just attached some things to yourself that maybe they're not a bad thing, but they're, they're definitely hindering you from the way you used to run. Time to lay those aside. Maybe for others of you, man, you're just, it's worse than that. You're encumbered. You, you're surrounded by sin. And Jesus died so that you could lay that aside. And still, there may be some of you They've actually fallen in this race and you're just, you're not even getting back up. And people come by and they try to give you a hand and you tell them all the reasons why you can't get up. Oh, my shoes, this is my shoes, that's a problem, I just can't. I don't like wearing those running shorts. Whatever, you know, you got all these excuses in a spiritual sense. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. And, and, and yet Jesus is saying, let me lift you up. Let me, let me give you a hand, come on. And for some of you guys tonight, you just need to get back in the race. You need to get back in the race. You need to start reading your Bible again. You need to start praying with your wife again. You start bringing your kids to church. Well, they don't want to come. Listen, they're coming. You just bring them and let God work. Run with endurance, the race that's set before us, because, guys, one day we're going to cross the finish line, and we're going to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Take that crown, throw it down, and worship for eternity. Will you pray with me tonight? And, Father, I thank you so much for my brothers tonight. Blessing being with them. And Lord, I want to pray right now. If there's any brothers here, Lord, perhaps they've just, they're weary in their race or they have find themselves being weighed down or even tripped up. Lord, I just want to pray for these guys tonight. And I just think it'd be good, appropriate. I just feel like the Lord put it on my heart tonight. If, if that's you and, and maybe you've, you, you're weary, man, in this race and you just need like the Spirit of God just to breathe into you afresh tonight. I just want you to stand up. I want to pray for you tonight. If anybody, maybe just one guy, a couple guys, if you need prayer tonight, I want to pray for you. I just want to know. That's awesome, guys. Yeah, and you know who you are. Maybe you're just, you're just tired. Maybe, maybe you, just, you just feel weighed down tonight. I'm gonna, I just want to pray that the Spirit of God would just move in such a way that he would just lift that burden or he'd free that weight and you just be able to run, man, with endurance, the race that's set before you. Maybe for others of you, I just need to get my eyes back on Jesus. You know, I've been looking at this and that and those people and this thing and listening to this and that. I need to get my eyes back on the Lord. This is the problem. This is why my marriage is struggling right now because I've taken my eyes off the Lord. I need to get them back on the Lord. Then, then you stand, I'll pray for you. And it's all right, man. We all need prayer, time to time. Anybody else, just go ahead and stand. Pray for you tonight. We love you guys, man. Lord, know you'd be here tonight. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Awesome, man. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And those brothers here that are seated, I want you to just kind of stand up. We do this. I love doing this with you guys. This is how we do it, man. You just go and lay hands on these brothers, and then I'm going to pray for them. Just, they're all around you. Just get up. Go lay hands on these guys. And just agree with us in prayer tonight. I want to pray for our brothers. I'm going to pray right now. Just quickly, let's get near a brother and we're going to pray. And those of you guys that stand, I want you to know we're standing with you tonight. We love you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up our brothers to you tonight who have stood to their feet. And you know the circumstance, you know the situation. And Lord, I want to pray right now that burdens would be lifted, Lord, off of these men. Lord, that chains would be broken. Lord, that there would be a renewed sense of focus and intention as they run. Lord, that there would be like just oxygen of the spirit in a sense coming into their lungs, just filling them once again, giving them second and third and fourth wind, Lord, so they can keep running. God, strengthen the hands that hang down tonight, the feeble knees. Lord, whatever the need is right now in this moment, we pray that you would meet it through the power of your spirit. Lord, you created us to run. 
And Lord, you ran the race and you promised to enable us so that we can run and we want to finish our course with joy. So Father, restore us, restore unto us the joy of our salvation and running this race. Thank you for hearing us tonight, Lord. May these men, when they leave this place, know that you've done a work in their heart tonight. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. Love you guys.